everyone and welcome to this week's London Speaker Bureau webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us and we hope that you're all keeping safe and well. We're delighted to have Dr Linda Yu join us today. Linda is an economist, broadcaster and writer. She's a fellow in economics at Oxford University, adjunct professor of economics at the London Business School and visiting professor at the London School of Economics. Her latest book, The Great Economist, how Their Ideas Can Help Us Today was the Times Best Business Book of the Year. Today, Linda will be discussing the economics of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we've also made some time to answer some of your questions towards the end of the webinar. As always, please feel free to use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen with any questions that you might have for Linda. And with that, I will pass you over to Linda. Welcome, Linda. Hi. Thank you very much, Katie. Good morning uh, to all of you. Thank you very much um, for joining. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to speak about the economics of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, and I'm going to, in the next 12-15 um, minutes or so, go through um, not just um, the shape of the recovery um, and the kinds of policies that we should expect uh, in the near future, as well as longer term, that's worth thinking about um, government policies. And throughout, I'm going to weave how businesses might just consider um, uh, managing this quite volatile period um, that we're going through. And then I'm going to finish with some um, thoughts on how COVID-19 is stalling, worsening, and accelerating um, some of the trends that we see in the global economy, which may offer um, opportunities um, as well. So uh, I very much look forward to uh, your questions um, and, uh, and comments um, after my presentation. Um, so I'm just going to kick off and say, what is the shape of the economic recovery. Um, and before I um, start, I'm just going to have to give you my first caveat, um, which is the great economist J.K. Galbraith said, um, economic forecasting exists to make astrology look respectable. So <laughs> this is a very difficult uh, time in particular uh, to forecast, which is difficult even in normal times. So I think in the near um, future, so the coming months and perhaps a um, year or two, a lot of this will depend on whether or not um, there is a vaccine. Uh, there will um, be quite a lot of different policies in different countries around social distancing. So a generalization, and this will differ um, for different countries, is we are looking at a very bumpy recovery. So the lockdown has really cut economic activity dramatically, as we've seen in lots of countries. But as the lockdowns are being eased, um, there will likely be a second peak. In other words, um, as interactions um, begin again, um, a second peak um, could lead to a further period of lockdown, which is what we've seen in some countries already. Um, but what it is going to suggest is, when I say bumpy, um, economic recovery. I do actually mean bumpy. So we're likely to have periods of stricter uh, lockdown um, followed by loosening restrictions. So it's quite likely um, that we're just going to go through a period in which um, the economy um, basically follows um, the pattern um, of lockdown. So um, there's obviously um, other factors, including policies, which I'll go through in a moment, that could affect this trend. Um, but what we do, we should expect um, in this period is a pretty slow recovery um, from the dramatic uh, collapse in economic activity in the first quarter of this year going into the second quarter. So if we're expecting a period of social distancing, then one of the things that businesses ought to be thinking about is how to be productive during social distancing and remote working. And this will differ by sector. Um, but if you look at, for instance, um, the economic study so far, businesses um, that are able to enable uh, working from home, um, they tend to have better productivity um, in the six years, in fact, before the pandemic and continuing now. And it goes for a country as well. 
um, if it's possible to make sure that social distancing and remote working um, can be done, not just for uh, more highly skilled uh, workers um, or indeed higher income people, which is what the current evidence shows. Then the mid um, parts um, of the industries and economies, if that could be enabled through further tech investment, uh, through changing business practices and uh, supporting people's skills, that will go a long way uh, to making sure that your business and country um, are more productive um, during this switch in, um, in the way that we work. So I mentioned a moment ago, um, policies will matter a great deal in how this recovery is shaped. Um, fiscal policy always matters, government, taxes and spending, but because this is a lockdown due to a pandemic, policies will be a very important part of the recovery. So, um, hysteresis is a concept that basically says if you have a short-term shock and people are no longer um, attached to their employers, they become discouraged or they become unemployed, then a short-term shock generates a long-term um, permanent effect, damage to the economy's growth potential. So a lot of the policies that we've seen are geared at preventing hysteresis. So, um, across countries, essentially policies have fallen into three different categories. I mean, well, a fourth one is, is um, health spending. But the three different categories of spending around the economic um, system are essentially the furlough schemes and the short time work schemes that have tried to keep workers attached to their employers. A second set of policies is keeping viable businesses afloat by giving them liquidity uh, through the banking system to ensure um, that uh, businesses and indeed who are also employers um, can make it through this shock. And then the final part is financial stability. So I think the question that we have to look at now is whether or not there'll be support for the recovery and not just for the shock from the pandemic itself. So for instance, um, countries like France are looking at short time work schemes um, up for the next two years to try and make sure people can get back into the labor force and avoid hysteresis. A lot of the very big government programs around liquidity um, is intended to do that as well. But there's one more thing I think businesses should be looking at in these countries when considering what all of these um, taken together and what all of these policies might imply. The pandemic will likely hit different countries at different times, as we've already seen, um, in terms of the recovery and not just the initial um, impact. So can businesses think about how you target different markets that might be open at different times? Um, are there policies, for instance, that a government could do to increase information about market supply chains, distribution chains, so that um, it would help businesses be more nimble and target the markets um, that are open and maybe pull back a bit from markets and countries which are going through um, another period um, of lockdown. And then I think finally, the other thing for businesses to think about and indeed to for governments to really focus on is fiscal policy can be better aligned with long-term growth goals. So again, for instance, looking at a country like Germany, um, they are aligning their spending, their fiscal stimulus in the pandemic with their longer term goal of becoming greener. So there will be incentives like cash for clunkers, um, giving uh, people uh, incentives to switch to hybrid or electric vehicles, possibly mandating charging stations um, in all petrol stations to try and just make that shift. So for the UK, um, that's certainly something that is also being considered and uh, the net zero target for 2050. And I think just generally targeting technology to raise productivity during social distancing could also align with the goal of lots of countries, which is to raise productivity, because we know lots of advanced economies are facing slow productivity growth, which is ultimately the reason why we have stagnant wages and low standards of living. So a business that I think can get on top of that um, and raise productivity um, and become greener um, could also be um, aligned with where a lot of these fiscal policies and advanced economies are currently headed. I'm going to finish with just some thoughts on global trends 
that have been affected by the pandemic, um, both in terms of being accelerated, which could offer opportunities, but also global trends that have been worsened um, by the pandemic. So I'm going to start with the, um, the big um, issue that we have been looking at for the last few years, which is a potential balkanization of the world economy due to the US-China um, trade war. Now that has been worsened um, by the pandemic, and I think we're going to continue to see um, quite a bit of that um, in the coming years. Um, and I would say that is not dependent on which administration it is in the United States. Um, there's essentially bipartisan um, uh, backing uh, for some, a lot of these um, uh, the, the trade tension, the tech tensions with China. And the pandemic has, of course, increased the, um, the tensions and the backlash against, um, against um, China and, and, um, and indeed um, wanting more reform of the multilateral system. Um, and a second trend I think that has been potentially stalled by the pandemic is the growth of the new global middle class. So by 2030, um, before the pandemic, um, there was this um, expectation that more than half of the world would become middle class um, in about 10 years time, making between 10 to $100 per day adjusted for what a dollar buys in their country. And that would be um, a historic moment um, where we would see middle, um, the middle class, middle income, um, a new uh, class group of them um, around the world economy. The pandemic um, likely has stalled um, that progress. Um, so that is just something to watch. Um, but I would say that in especially Asia, um, the pandemic's economic impact seems to be less at this point. Um, than in other emerging economies. And given that a lot of the new global middle class um, were expected to be in Asia, um, I would also just make sure as a business you look at a differentiated uh, global set of markets. And then finally, there are another couple of very big trends um, that have been shaping uh, the world economy, the growth in digital services trade, um, one in eight tra cross-border transactions are now e-commerce, um, and that was negligible a decade ago. So I think it's pretty apparent that the pandemic um, has accelerated um, remote working, it's accelerated um, services trade, the invisible trade, um, as people are connected now more easily uh, to offer services from professional services, um, to business services, uh, to a range of things. And I think we should expect um, the people getting accustomed and becoming easier um, in, uh, in terms of business norms to work um, in this way will, uh, will be with us. And so this big trend of moving, um, thinking about global trade, not just in terms of manufactured goods and tariffs or taxes, um, which all of which um, are still obviously important, but to think about market opening for accessing services sectors, um, having some type of global standards uh, for uh, digital and data. Um, I think all of those things uh, will become more important in the years to come. So to conclude, um, I think um, the 21st century global economy um, was always going to be a rather different place um, because of these underlying trends propelled um, by technology, um, including 3D printing that has changed the way supply chains operate, by e-commerce, which has been accelerated by the pandemic um, and people's uh, ease um, of buying things online. And I think for any business, just thinking about situating um, within uh, the 21st century global economy uh, will be even more important than before. So with that, I'm going to pause and I very much look forward uh, to your questions and to your comments. And I have one here. Um, so this is a question from Noel uh, Cohan, uh, who asks, how important are coordinated policies to recovery in an interdependent world and who will drive coordination across borders? It's a great question. Um, and I think one of the um, worries about the lack of um, global coordination, um, which is really, I think, 
um, become very apparent um, in this pandemic. Um, this is something that I don't see this trend changing, um, even though we all think it is very important. So for instance, fiscal policy, if you think about the global financial crisis from 10 years ago, when a country uh, boosts its economy, part of that uh, spill over into other countries is because you've made your own market, um, you boost the demand in your own market, uh, which is a source of um, exports for other countries. So the G20, uh, which met earlier this year, um, did try to promote um, more of that, um, but I don't think we've seen a lot of results because there is such tension um, in the global um, economic system. That being said, the pandemic has essentially hit regions of the world um, you know, sequentially. So it started in China and Asia, moved to Europe, then it moved to um, where it currently sits, which is in the Americas. So the, the fiscal policies um, probably had at least a regional um, spillover um, in any case. Um, and I think probably the broader um, point um, implied by your um, question is around, you know, who will drive coordination across borders. And this is, to me, one of the hardest um, questions for the global economy looking ahead. So the multilateral system and institutions, um, they are not really equipped to deal with some of these 21st century global economic trends that I've described. So for instance, um, global services trade um, isn't really, um, doesn't really have the same opening as goods trade under, under the World Trade Organization. And it's very hard to find um, which country or which economic bloc is going to be able to, uh, to really push that liberalization along. And that's hugely important because it's a trend that's already growing, despite the fact the markets are not as open as goods trade. And if you look at advanced economies, um, the biggest part um, of GDP is in the services sector. Um, but that being said, I think there are some um, smaller attempts, um, so not sort of big headline grabbing attempts, but there are smaller attempts uh, to increase coordination, at least on some things. So for instance, um, last year, a group of countries um, are pushing for liberalization of digital uh, trade, so data, e-commerce, um, and they're hoping that if a group of countries does it, there'll be enough interest that it could become a big multilateral or WTO initiative. Um, so that's one example, um, but there are challenges because different countries have very different um, standards for data and for digital. So as a gross generalization, and this is a generalization, um, if you look at who owns data, that's an example of the differences. So in China, the state owns your data. In the United States, companies own your data. And in Europe, um, individuals, um, we own our own data. So finding some type of global standard um, is going to be challenging because you've got different um, approaches to this. Um, and what we've also seen, even in terms of leadership of multilateral organizations like the World Trade Organization, um, choosing um, the new head of that is, is already itself subject to um, uh, tensions and rivalries between countries. So if China suggests someone, the US is expected to veto that. If the US suggests someone, China is expected to veto that. So now there's a move um, by uh, the EU and um, the African Union to try to come up with a candidate. But there are also bright spots, um, I should also um, say, because just, um, uh, very recently, um, there is now a new group in the United Nations, um, which is co-led um, by the UK, um, which is going to try and achieve COP26 goals around climate change. So, you know, by bringing together a group, um, a coalition of countries that want to work to further global public goods, like um, addressing the climate crisis by sharing technology and know-how, this kind of grouping, this kind of initiative begins to address some of the, well, this, this, this gap in the global system where you don't have a, um, you know, a organization um, that is geared at um, climate change um, in the same way, say, the WTO is geared at trade. 
So I think there are going to be more initiatives like that, which would be very welcome. Um, but again, I don't want to underplay um, how important um, tensions are in terms of global leadership right now. It's, you know, the US-China trade tension is ultimately um, about power and that is unlikely to be resolved um, anytime soon. So next question uh, that's come in um, by um, Abdalila uh, Balatik. Um, the pandemic is rising in countries um, in developing markets, Africa, Latin America. These countries have limited tools for fiscal monetary policies. What actions can they take to mitigate the risks of the economic impact of the pandemic? Yeah, so another great question. Um, I think emerging markets, um, particularly um, the regions that you describe in Sub-Saharan Africa and um, Latin America, um, they are going to struggle in terms of, um, I think, a particularly recovery from the pandemic. Now, I would probably say the challenges are slightly different, um, obviously, depending on the market. Um, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, the pressures in the public health system, the fact that even before the pandemic, 18 countries were at risk of default, according to the IMF, that was already there even before um, uh, this recent shock. And this is why there's been this uh, G20 agreement for a debt interest moratorium. So at least um, the poorest developing countries wouldn't take any money that's been um, that could be used to address the pandemic to pay uh, interest on their debt. So I think, you know, it's going to be challenging um, for them. Um, and it's going to be challenging, I think, for some of these countries to avoid a crisis um, if the pandemic worsens. Now, the, you know, what the G20 hopes is that private um, investors and creditors may also give some space to these countries. And I think that would help. Uh, the IMF and World Bank um, also have increased spending um, on these countries and I think it's absolutely essential because whatever happens with this pandemic in one part of the world will affect the rest of the world. Um, but you know that absolutely hits one of the, the key risks going ahead which is um, you know can the pandemic be contained in countries which um, may struggle um, for um, you know, uh, uh, public health and economic reasons. And if they don't get it under control, then I think um, it's going to be a long time before the pandemic is really um, contained uh, for the entire world. Um, and uh, another question has come in uh, is by Cecile uh, Saunier. Can we pursue objectives in terms of sustainability at the same time as boosting the economy to recover from the pandemic? So the answer here is yes, absolutely. So um, when I was um, kind of describing uh, the importance of policies during this time, you know, I stressed that um, it's really very important that fiscal policy, all of the spending and which is now being done by governments is used to align um, the economy towards longer term goals. And that is greening the economy and becoming more productive. And this is, this is, you know, this is the, um, the opportunity to do it. Uh, so one of the things the pandemic has done is dropped interest rates and the cost of borrowing to levels that are lower than what we saw 10 years ago, because of course we were starting at a low level already. So to lock in a very low borrowing costs and to invest, that is a way of using fiscal policy to change the infrastructure of a country that could make it more productive and generate uh, returns. And I don't just mean returns in terms of growth, I mean returns in terms of um, the environment, um, the, the clash for clunkers example that I was giving. There, the importance of switching to greener um, infrastructure, energy sources, and this is the time to invest in green infrastructure um, in order to produce these higher returns. And in that way, um, if a country is borrowing to invest and to grow, um, it's also, I think, um, addressing one of the big challenges we see, which is a lot of advanced economies face a slow growth future. So with low borrowing costs, this is an opportunity to align fiscal policy to longer term growth goals. And I think the countries that get this right uh, will be in a much better position uh, than countries that have invested 
or borrowed and done so in a non-strategic way. Um, another question uh, uh, by, um, this is from uh, Venkat uh, Sandraram, who asks, how can organizations look at employee productivity or what kind of tools can be used to ensure employee productivity? in terms of working from home? Yeah, another great question. Um, so there are different, um, I don't, I think the jury is out on this one um, for at the moment um, in terms of what it would be the best uh, management approach. There are some who's talking about Peter Drucker's approach about, um, you know, giving positive, um, basically carrots, incentives, um, rather than micromanaging. And there are others who are really monitoring um, screen time and other things. I think probably, um, you know, getting social distancing to be productive probably does need um, quite a bit of adjustment in terms of business practices. And it'll be different from for every organization. Um, but I can think of, for instance, um, a lot of workers like to have flexibility and to be goal oriented. Um, and I think, you know, you allowing remote working um, could actually allow workers to have more flexibility to achieve their goals. Um, so that's just one example. But the technology underpinning the ability to use remote working, having collaborative software, all of those things are also extremely important to make sure that um, we can be more productive during social distancing. Um, what I can say is that um, the economic evidence suggests so far that uh, most um, businesses are not as productive during social distancing. The latest figures from the UK shows that um, services sector productivity fell across the board um, on average around 20% um, during social distancing. So we know there's room um, for improvement um, there. And again, the company, I think that can get that right, um, will be in a far better uh, position um, in the near future. We only have about a minute left, but I do want to try and squeeze in this final question um, from Natalie Nilsson, who says, uh, according to a Fortune 500 CEO survey, over 60% think nationalism will rise after the pandemic and global supply chains will become less common. Do I agree? How do I see global supply chains changing in the next few years and months? These are just fantastic questions. <laughs> and so I think um, Global supply chains are going to become more localized. Um, they're going to, there's going to be a rebalancing of supply chains um, after the pandemic. Now, this is a trend that started before the pandemic because what we'd already seen um, were a number of forces that were pushing for essentially um, having more regional and local supply chains. So I think in a nutshell, um, you know, there was reshoring and manufacturing to the United States because of rising wages in China, shale revolution, lowering energy costs in the United States, very competitive uh, unit labor costs based on productivity, and of course, 3D printing. Um, so um, I write about this in my book that 99% of the airplanes um, that you fly on has a 3D printed part. So that actually has even become uh, more um, I suppose, um, efficient than just in time uh, cross border uh, moves of intermediate products. And I think the pandemic, um, along with the US China trade tension, the uncertainty around Brexit and borders, I think all of that is pushing for, for lots of uh, companies to look hard at supply chains and just make sure that they have both robustness and resilience. And that, that probably is going to accelerate this trend of having more local and regional supply chains and not just global ones. And the final thing to say is lots of countries are now reviewing supply chains, at least key ones in terms of medicine, in terms of components necessary for say national security. So I think we should expect um, there will be a greater national policy um, analysis of essentially balancing commercial openness, which is what supply chains are, allowing businesses to do things efficiently, regardless of borders, um, with these other policy considerations. Um, and I think this is a trend that um, we are likely to see going ahead. So we are now, unfortunately, um, out of time. Um, you've had lots of great questions, which I've really enjoyed answering. And um, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, and I hope that thinking about the economics of the pandemic um, and what businesses should be thinking about, I should want to end on a, um, a more positive note, um, which is to say, 
um, every time you have this kind of big shakeup, it is actually an opportunity to rethink uh, a country's economy, a business's um, a strategic approach. And I think the 21st global economy was always going to be very different um, than the previous um, century. And this is an occasion to think hard um, about what the 21st century global economy looks like in terms of risks, but most importantly, in terms of opportunities. Um, and sometimes it does take a big shakeup um, for an organization, a country to do that. So I think that is um, uh, hopefully uh, where we'll be headed in the coming months and years. Um, and, um, and with that, I want to thank you. And, um, and I hope uh, to have a, a future opportunity uh, to delve into these issues maybe even in person you never know <laughs> thanks very much thank you linda for a truly brilliant session it was it was just so insightful and thank you everyone for joining us today um, if you have any questions about today's webinar please feel free to email us at webinars at londonspeakerbureau.com and don't forget to join us next week uh, we will be joined by mike coop recent CEO of the leading supermarket chain Sainsbury's uh, in conversation with Samantha Simmons. So have a great rest of the day and we look forward to seeing you next week.